Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the World Ayurveda podcast where we've been bringing to you some really fascinating conversations with global ambassadors from the world of Ayurveda, no matter which part of the world they are located in and whether they are students, teachers, researchers, doctors, uh, business persons, any Ayurveda enthusiast, uh, you know, who is worth speaking to. We are bringing you those conversations on this World Ayurveda podcast. My name is Ritika Patni. I am the founder of Art of Health, Art in Singapore, and also a core group member of the Ayurveda Day celebrations, which are being globally anchored by the Center for Public Diplomacy and Soft Power of India Foundation. I'm delighted today to welcome my guest. Some of you may know him as an acclaimed author, for others, he is well known as the co-founder of Pakka Herbs, Sebastian Pohl. Welcome, Sebastian. We are very delighted to have you today with us. Hello, Ritika. Good to be with you and namaste, everybody. So Pakka Herbs is a very well-recognized brand today, but uh, I think it started way back in 2001. Uh, and really, it stands for all the, all the things which you would associate with the goodness of Ayurveda. Uh, and today's conversation with Sebastian, we'll try and go down that road to really understand uh, how Sebastian has created uh, such a wonderful Ayurveda brand uh, around principles of sustainability. So starting from the start, Sebastian, uh, you know, how, how did you discover Ayurveda and what drew you to Ayurveda? Well, you know, I came to India and I suddenly started discovering this great long tradition where there was this insight into how we could use nature and the daily rhythms and cycles of life to optimize our health. And, you know, it wasn't one particular thing. It was meeting a few different people. Um, it was getting a bit ill and meeting some Ayurvedic doctors and getting better from that. And... You know, I was a young man, I was uh, 18 when I first came to India and I was questioning what I wanted to do with my life and how could I do something of value. And then over a few years of visiting India, getting interested in yoga and, you know, it started to dawn on me, how, how come I was lucky to have a, a really good education, you know, how come in my education, I, I hadn't been taught about these ideas around self-care and um, simple things like caring for your digestion or following seasonal rhythms. And so I got really inspired by it. And of course, um, the wonderful bookshops in India that you can go into and Matilal Banasi Das and all these great books you can find. I, I just got really interested in it. And so it was, it was a bit of um, uh, inspiration from this mystery. And it was a bit of direct experience experience from getting better and then I had a quite a passionate interest in ecology and uh, how we are growing our food as well and as I started to look into where Ayurvedic herbs came from I got more and more intrigued as to their future sustainability. Wonderful. Um, one of your books Sebastian uh, you know it's called Ayurvedic Medicine and you know for anyone who's read that book uh, and I highly recommend it to anybody who is interested in Ayurveda or herbs. Uh, but that, that book really is a testament to your love for Ayurveda and herbs. So can you tell us a little more about your journey of really discovering uh, you know, such a wide variety of herbs and uh, your kind of love affair with uh, you know, all these herbs? Well, I wrote Ayurvedic Medicine because I wanted to have um, you know, one place where I could look up and refer to uh, what some of the, the herbs did, their activity, their safety, their dosage. And I, when I was studying Ayurveda, I found it very difficult to find this out. Of course, uh, if you are excellent at Sanskrit and you know the texts brilliantly, you can find out lots of these things. But as the world has moved on and there are things like drug herb interactions we need to take care of, or, or our clients can be using drugs, you know, how would these herbs interact with them? I got very interested in doing the research. And yeah, the more you look into plants, the more you discover it's an eternal journey. You, you, you can't stop learning. And it was really my effort to collate lots of the wisdom that was already there. I don't think I presented anything particularly novel. 
uh, apart from bringing it to, um, you know, between two covers, so to speak. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so one of the questions which I often think of is, you know, what would, for people who live in countries where you don't get a lot of the commonly known Ayurveda herbs, uh, what would you say advice to them? You know, what can they do to kind of adopt an Ayurveda lifestyle or to really access these herbs? Well, I think the main thing is to learn the language of Ayurveda, isn't it? As soon as you learn the language of Ayurveda and you understand the basic premise of, um, you know, dosha, datu, and the uh, uh, dravya guna, the effects of the herbs, the energetic qualities, um, you can then apply that to any plant that you are able to taste and experience. Um, I think a lot of Ayurveda herbs are very globally available these days. Um, you know, particularly across Asia, a lot of the same plants grow, you know, uh, mandakapani, gotakola, kaldi, turmeric, ginger, of course, all across Asia. Um, and in other parts of the world, of course, there's very vibrant traditions of using uh, natural medicine, whether that's in, in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, or uh, European Western herbalism, so-called. And I think it's really, it's learning the language of Ayurveda. If you learn what the taste of something is, it's uh, rasa, and then you can understand its energetic principle and learn where it goes in the body, you can then subscribe that principle. And so that's something that I've done. I mean, I'm a very eclectic practitioner and I, um, you know, have to admit to cherry picking various bits of from different traditions because I think in our global world we live in, I, th I think that our access to some of the best herbs from different traditions is really important for people's health. And uh, Ayurveda obviously excels in certain areas, but I think there are some great herbs that we can get across Europe as well that it's important to include that can, that you know, in history, India's had a long history of using herbs from other countries um, as, uh, as as China has imported a lot of uh, insight from Ayurveda into their pharmacopoeia and their materia medica. So I'm, I'm all for sharing and using plants around the world to optimize health. Uh, but the, the, the best thing to do locally if you can't get some Ayurvedic species is to discover what your local plants are. And that's a very valuable journey. And quite a few authors have written good books, for example, about the energetics of Western herbs. So uh, Annie McIntyre is a great author. She's written some good books on using Western herbs. Um, uh, Dr. Ladd, of course, has written books like that, um, etc. You know, lots of examples there. Yeah, I think that, you know, what's really fascinating is that the language of Ayurveda is so universal that even though, you know, I mean, Ayurveda came out of India, but really the, the language of Ayurveda is can be used absolutely anywhere. So, um, okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for that uh, little insight. Uh, we'll now come to, you know, your journey with Paka, because that is something uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in. How did the idea of Paka come about? Uh, and also, how did the name Paka really come about? Well, the, um, the I idea came about from really seeing a need in, in Europe anyway, where uh, there was a much reduced diet in terms of its variety, um, a dependence on pharmaceutical medication and a lack of appreciation of good quality herbs, I suppose. And I, I also had, as I alluded to before, you know, looked into some of the supply and viability regarding Ayurvedic herbs. And I started to see that quite a few of them were endangered. You know, some of the main Ayurvedic herbs like Jata Mamsi, Kutki, um, even licorice in India um, due to, um, you know, different reasons. And, and I, I wanted to, yeah, have the opportunity to reach people. And I thought a simple way of doing that was in a cup of tea that is, you know, a, a simple thing you can include relatively affordably every day, but I wanted to do it. So we were using really good quality herbs. You know, I also had an ex a background in as a, um, working on organic farm, growing herbs. And I knew that if you grew good quality herbs yourself and you dried them properly, um, you could get an amazing flavor. And in our world of loving sensual delights, 
you know, I knew that we had to give good quality, tasty herbs to people for them to appreciate what a good cup of Tulsi tastes like, as opposed to a poor cup of Tulsi. Or, you know, there's, there's qualities, isn't there, in the market of vegetables, spices, everything. And, and, you know, this was 25 years or so ago. The herb market was uh, not renowned for giving the best quality, I would say. And what we've done is we've, we've spent many years now focusing on how we can measure and analyze our herbs to know that we're using a, what we call a practitioner grade herb, which essentially meets a pharmacopoeial grade for essential oil content, for uh, marker compounds, as well as all the contaminants and safety issues. So yeah, because um, there's something about a relationship with the plant, there's something about really knowing how a plant grows, you know, where it comes from, who are the people growing it. And when I started up Pucker with uh, Tim Westwell, my business partner at Pucker, you know, we had this idea of creating circles of benevolence so that, you know, I strongly felt that um, through business, you can do good everywhere you go. It doesn't have to be at the exploitation of individuals or of nature. And, you know, we were lucky that we're selling plants. And so that's already got a good glow to it in a way if it's done properly. And so we insisted from the beginning that we would be 100% organic. And um, we, we would look at the social values in our value chain, as we call it. We don't call it a supply chain as such because everyone's a stakeholder and connected. And we would endeavor to deliver something really special for people in the world that wasn't there. And that was something that was uh, based on tradition, that was blended in a way that was energetically balanced and that had a strong intent. And I'd spend a lot of time considering the intent of a blend and who we were going to serve and what did we want the outcome to be not just a nice cup of tea or a, a well put together capsule but a strong health benefit as well and it was at a time in the world when you know the climate debate had been talked about for quite a long time you know we'd, we'd known for quite a few years that carbon in the atmosphere was going up that biodiversity was getting threatened and we, we saw an opportunity for there to be conservation through commerce. You know, how could you use business to ensure that a forest is more valuable standing than cut down? And so I'm, uh, yeah, I know pride isn't a great emotion, but I'm very proud of our work in sustainable wild harvesting and how we've engaged with wild harvesters around the world, as you, you may, may, may know this or not, but 25% of all the herbs in the world we use by volume come from the wild. Um, millions and millions of kilos. And in India, in Ayurveda, I think it's more like over 70%, um, uh, uh, definitely on a species level, that the, the numbers of herbs coming out of the world is, is so high that we have to find a way of protecting those communities, which are often marginalized because they are often poor people living on the edge of society. Um, but also these plants are getting over harvested as well. Uh, or, or not harvested in a way that is sustainable. And so I think the whole Ayurvedic community, the whole community working in natural health need to, you know, we need to wake up immediately to this fact that the communities are, are not going to be there in the future if we don't pay them enough money to value the work and, and the herbs won't be there either if we, if we keep over harvesting. So sorry, slightly long-winded answer into how we set Pucker up, but they were, they were key things. You know, there's a, there's a crisis in nature. Yeah. Um, on the climate front and the biodiversity front. And there's a crisis in health. And I, you know, the, the real feeling behind Pucker uh, to choose that name was because Pucker means genuine or, you know, genuine or authentic uh, or really tasty more colloquially. And so we wanted that name to deliver what we, we really, really was behind our intention. Wonderful, that was, uh, that was a really fascinating insight, thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit, you know, in your uh, response right now about, uh, of course, uh, the herbal teas that you've been making at Baka ever since Baka started. Uh, but, you know, I remember, uh, Sebastian, that, you know, there were several other brands also really selling kind of herbal teas at that time uh, in the UK market. So what would you say really made Baka stand out and, you know, develop into this brand to really reckon with? I think we, you know, we 
set out to serve people and i think we we were there to serve people with what they wanted it's a bit like you know the sustainability the fair trade aspect the high grade herbs you know we were doing our customers work for them in a way you know they would expect that of us so i think we came into a market where no disrespect to the other brands but you know herbal tea was a sort of add-on to their portfolio if you like you know they were in black tea or coffee or mm. hot chocolate or something and herbal tea was like a flavored drink to have whereas we were like these are the plants of life really you know these are what you know the, the sort of little interventions you can make in your life that improve your life exponentially that improve your digestion that help your nervous system function effectively and that improve your mood that, that can help your system you know, it's just little bits, but I, I really like this idea of little 1% improvements in life. If you can bring in, imagine if you bring in 10 things that improve your life by 1% and your life is 10% better in a week. You know, I'd have that. I'm always trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously it's not always easy to keep it going in that continual improvement direction. And I, I think that's what Ayurveda talks about, really. It talks about how we're always... Um, making small contributions to our health through dinacharya and our daily routine and how you know ayurveda defines health as swasta you know being established in yourself and through taking in little empowering moments particularly in a world we live in today where it can feel quite out of control certain aspects of life um i think ayurveda gives us that opportunity to take take uh, take charge of our health that way so I, I like those little micro interventions. And we, we came in and we offered something that, you know, it looked good, it tasted good, and it did good. And we we're going to carry on doing that. And we're going to be as ambitious as we can possibly think about, because I think the need has never been greater, as we see, you know, metabolic syndrome, diabetic crises, um, not even to mention immune issues going on around the world. You know, I think the need for plants to play a larger part in our life is uh, good for society. It's, it's cheaper medicine than modern medicine and it's, uh, it's empowering. And I think, you know, India holds on to a lot of that and, and a lot of uh, countries where their culture remains a bit closer to nature. But I think we can see that India, Europe, China, you know, is losing a lot of that as well as we industrialize and modernize. And I, I, I hope that the recent increase in interest in Ayurveda coming out of India and the Indian government can help promote it around the world in a way that is true to Ayurveda, but also relevant to, to the cultures it moves into as well. And that uh, it's allowed to take on its own form in a way, because I think that is empowering for people. Uh, Anyway, I'm sure we'll talk about that. There's a lot to talk about with regard to the Ayurvedic community around the world and how we empower ourselves. Absolutely. Um, before we go down that uh, path, Sebastian, just very briefly, what's really interesting about your background also is that, you know, you, you were trained in Ayurvedic medicine and also in, you know, Chinese herbs and Ayurvedic herbs. So, um, for a lot of people out there who don't really uh, have that background or don't understand, you know, how would you explain what are the similarities and uh, dissimilarities between these systems? Gosh, you know, 4,000 years of medical history in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, Chinese medicine is a beautiful system of medicine, truly clear, uh, logical, um, with a very uh, a great articulation of, of diagnosis and uh, pathology and uh, herbal prescribing really the, the way that a herbal prescription is put together I mean their similarities are you know obviously based on a on an energetic principle in a way that there is a dynamic between our own health relationship and the patterns in the environment uh, you know through our diet climate ancestral inheritance um, and you know we talk about prana in Ayurveda and we talk about chi in, uh, in Chinese medicine for example I think they're similar. I don't think they're exactly the same. And I think you have to be a bit careful of um, cross-referencing. But that's something I'm always, you know, really careful about when I'm seeing a client and I'm writing a prescription as I'd, you know, I'd write a prescription, I'd write an Ayurveda prescription, I mean, a diagnosis, and I'd write a Chinese diagnosis. And then you'd 
you know, write the treatment plan accordingly, because I, I think you have to be cautious there. Um, there's a lot of similarities around building your inherent vitality, if you like, and ojas, and in Chinese medicine, there's this concept of jing, which is your inherited sort of ancestral wealth, your genetic code, if you like, and benefit. There's a lot of focus on rejuvenation, which I think really dif is a differential really from contemporary medicine where, you know, it's very good at acute and, you know, disease orientated uh, treatments, but it doesn't really look after the host resilience quite as well, I don't think. And this focus on racionic tonics um, is very relevant. And then there are loads of comparisons, but the last one I'd say is a real focus on digestion. I think uh, Ayurvedic focus on Agni and building the metabolism there is crucial. And in Chinese medicine, there's a, a big focus on spleen chi function and ability to transform, transform food. And if that isn't done well, then that leads to all the problems we know about. Uh, the differences are, I think, I mean, this is all based on my experience and that, you know, I'm, I'm limited in my Ayurveda and Chinese experience, but my feeling on a contemporary level is that there is a, a lot of support for Chinese medicine and that you can see it's global, you know, there's a Chinese medical store on lots of high streets around the UK and Europe. Um, it's, it's got a very clear um, articulation of different diseases. And I think Chinese medicine's really progressed very effectively in that regard, using, you know, modern disease terminology with Chinese medicine prescriptions. And I think they face the same challenges though, which is, you know, a sort of global acceptance of the medical paradigm that Ayurveda and Chinese medicine adhere to. I think that is a major issue and we, we need to be much better as a community, I think, at articulating our relationship with evidence-based medicine and, and, and where we stand with a traditional approach to evidence. And I think we also need to really address sustainability. Which I, you know, I, I think there's a big issue facing supply of, of various herbs in the future. Um, but perhaps most of all, I feel it's about the different Ayurvedic and potentially Chinese organizations coming in, coming together so that we can be represented if it's at the WHO or you know or whatever level with a with a singular voice in a sense that we we may share different approaches but we have the same goal and for me it's all medicine whatever you're using you know from a simple cup of ginger tea to you know a big prescription of you know mahasudarshan or something like that you know it's it's a uh, we're using you know anti-inflammatories or some of the famous Chinese formulas. They're all interventions to help improve people's health. And I think we could all learn from each other's traditions um, enormously. Okay, fantastic. Um, Sebastian, um, you touched upon this briefly, but uh, you know we know that one of the biggest challenges for Ayurveda in particular has been uh, to ensure reliable and standardized quality of herb. Uh, when I speak to people about Ayurveda, often, uh, whether it's in India or outside, uh, people often, uh, you know, have slight uh, reservation around whether the quality of the medicine or the herb that they are getting, uh, whether that, that is really up to the mark. So uh, how have you overcome this challenge by building Pakka? Well... There are two, type, two sides to that question. You know, there's the public perception and then there's what we've done at, at Pucker in a way. And I think the public perception is, you know, a bit like a lot of media today. It's driven by a lot of um, confusion, sort of polarised conversation. You know, news is made up of bad news. And so a lot of what people have heard about Ayurveda is that there's contamination, there's heavy metals, etc. You know, to be honest, I think we've brought quite a bit of that on ourselves by not adhering to some of the standards that should be applied, I'd say. And I am definitely concerned about some of the herbs that are on the open market in terms of analysis and real consistency of supply. And I, I think that comes down to um, a bit of self-regulation from the industry to have its own standard and adhere to that. And there are some self-regulatory mechanisms in place, but really it comes down to the companies as well to, 
test, test, test. You, you, you know, you've got to know where your suppliers. So you've got to you've got to create a relationship is the first thing. So you've got to know where your suppliers. You've got to work with your suppliers to help them know your standards, and you've got to understand their challenges. I mean, you know, we're losing, you know, a few crops every year now because of storm damage or, or weather weather issues. So the climate change is a massive issue. Um, We've got to look at living incomes. We've got to make sure we're paying the right amount so these communities can live off the, the wages. And I think going around Bowley in Delhi or somewhere like that, you know, it's a, you know, they're underpriced herbs is what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that because Bucket sells herbs. I'm saying that because of the, of the value that they have for people's health and livelihoods. And I also think we don't have a set standard for when we say it's ashwagandha, what do we think should be at sort of marker compound levels with analytes or when we're selling ginger, how much essential oil is in there. And there is the Indian pharmacopoeia and the European pharmacopoeia. And I, the bottom line is we should all be adhering to those standards a bit more. If we're, if we're selling medicines, we should be selling that. You know, if you're selling ginger in the market, that's your food type ginger. You, you sell that and you buy that as you like. But I think we have an opportunity through the brilliance of, the brilliance of science and all the great chemistry available to us and the great analysts to, to upgrade that. So I think that's, that's an absolutely crucial thing. Um, so, you know, we, we know that Paka has, you know, been built on the principles of organic farming and fair trade. Uh, you've, of course, been championing sustainable business practices uh, in Paka and were also recently nominated to the board of Fair Wild Foundations uh, last year. So 2020, uh, with the COVID crisis, has only reinforced the importance of sustainability, uh, you know, for the times ahead moving on from here. So what would you say, uh, can people really use, how can people really use the teachings of Ayurveda for sustainable and natural living? Well, if you look at what Ayurveda teaches, one of the first, as I understand it, you know, one of the first approaches to life is Dharma and how do we follow our true purpose in life? And, you know, Dharma, the root word is about supporting isn't it and and when we are supporting life it means supporting a life that is sustainable and and sort of regenerated so it's there in the future and i think all all of us could look at this continually i think it's it's not a place you arrive at necessarily but it's something that we need to investigate anyone that's got a practice or that is buying herbs or that is selling herbs or i made it formulas um you got to certify your business with a type of sustainable certification. I mean, that is a must. I mean, I, you know, I'm a passionate believer in organic farming because uh, it is the only system of farming that I'm aware of that meets the principles of Ayurveda, which is about feeding life and giving back to life what you take from it and not harming lots of insects and biodiversity in the process. So for me, an Ayurveda business that isn't organic isn't really following the principles of Ayurveda. Um, I know that might be controversial because there have been lots of Ayurveda businesses around before the principles of organic in a way, but I, I think people could, uh, you know, really ensure that there is some sustainability in their, in their value chain. Um, I think people could declare a climate emergency. Anyone that's involved in Ayurveda must know there's a climate emergency because you can see quality changes in herbs. I've already talked about Jatamansi and Kutki and you know, numerous other species that are threatened and that are essential to Ayurveda. You know, more Google is sold every year than is harvested. So, you know, the, we, we need to find a way of controlling this as a, as a community. And, um, and then invest in your business in expert people that know about sustainability to help you because it's a big task and it's not a right or wrong path i think you know businesses have to choose what is right for them but i think you want to invest time in having experts in the business and dedicating that to recognizing if you don't mitigate the risk of climate change in your business you're not going to make any money anyway so even if you're solely profit driven you have to do it from a commercial point of view and i and i think that yeah just go back to that teaching of uh, dharma really and and really meditate and think about what that means to support uh, support a world and support a society 
and try and apply that as best one can because there, you know, there are bound to be compromises and tensions in that journey. You know, we we, we of course have them at Pucker all the time. There are there are challenges in our world, but I think by dreaming big and being fixed on that vision and helping your team, you you know, which in the end the people in your business are the are the whole business. You know inspire them to come with you on on the journey and I, you know there's a massive step up we need to do Ritika in Ayurveda it's massive and I we need to do it urgently as well um so along with the promotion of Ayurveda around the world you know we need to promote the Ayurvedic values but we need to we need to walk that talk as well um and I I, I visited a lot of Ayurvedic facilities a lot of harvest centers in my time I mean hundreds and um there's always work we can do to improve. Um, so with almost now two decades of PAKA, you know, PAKA has been around for now since 2001, uh, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. But what do you think really in today's time, what is really the opportunity from a business standpoint in the Ayurveda sector? Well, I mean, the world is your oyster, as they say, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's a huge opportunity, isn't it? I mean, there's a, from the point of view of um, health issues, there's a whole range of health issues that the modern medical system is struggling to uh, provide for. There are quite a few therapeutic gaps that are not in, you're not well treated in our modern medical system. Um, there is, you know, it needs to be a multi-dimensional approach. You know, we need to have everybody working together for the same end. We might have different routes to get there, uh, but I, you know, the opportunity, whether it's in clinic or in punch karma or whether it's in retail, I, th I think is huge. It's difficult for me to quantify it, to be honest, but I think uh, done well and genuinely, uh, I, I think because Ayurveda is so empowering, isn't it? Because you, as we were saying at the beginning, the principles are so easy. You know, you don't need to be a, nuclear physicist or a neurosurgeon to understand the principles of Ayurveda. Uh, they're very simple. You need to be, uh, you know, Ayurvedic genius to practice it because it's so individualized and so complex when you get into the implementation of Ayurveda potentially. But the, for everyday use for people in their daily life, learning how to follow Dhinacharya, learning how to follow some of the principles is very easy. And so I think for that reason, it's very engaging Ayurveda. And I think some of the other medical traditions around the world, they're not so easy to grasp some of the concepts. And so I think you've got to be clear about what you're trying to do if you're setting up an Ayurveda business though. You know, it's obviously very competitive and um, it seems to go in waves, doesn't it? The interest in Ayurveda. And, uh, and in a way, probably a lot of people generalizing heavily here, but in the West think a lot of Ayurveda is a spa treatment. Um, and, you know, it, it's obviously multi-layered Ayurveda. And I think one of the challenges we have is where it's perceived as a medical practice, whereas actually it's a whole lifestyle. And in, in the West, I think we have a real problem with differentiating between our life and um, between health and illness, really. We sort of see them as separate things. Whereas in Ayurveda, of course, they're a continuum. And so I think there's a lot of work needed to have a conversation with the outside world about the principles of Ayurveda. Um, Sebastian, Pakka was acquired by Unilever a couple of years back. Uh, you know, that was all over the news. What would your advice be to Ayurveda startups? And there are quite a few of those nowadays, um, you know, who are looking to really disrupt the sector from your experience. Um, I'm not a fan of disruption, actually. Um, I know that's a, no, you know, I understand why you're saying it. I know it's a commonly used word. I think it's, I think uh, you want to look at contribution. You know, what can the Ayurvedic community contribute to the future goodness in the world? And I think what we've always done in a way is being really quite selfish. And just done what you know, Tim and I and the, the other leaders at Pucker, the other thinkers, you know, what, what we want to do for ourselves, you know, the world we want to live in. You know, ask 
yourself that, you know, what world do you want to live in and make sure you're selling it and, you know, make sure you're using what you sell, that you, you know, you really believe in it as the best and stretch the standards and you know, do something better than anyone's already done. Don't just repeat it. There's plenty of Chuana pressures, you know, let's not do any more Chuana pressures. Let's do something that's really good in Chuana Prash. I mean, you know, let's, you know, you know, declare a climate emergency, become a B Corp, you know, do, if it's in India, you know, do what's relevant in India to garnering an interest from the younger generation to bring along a wellspring of change, which, you know, we all need. So I couldn't recommend it enough. You'd only go, it'll only stretch you as an individual as well. If you're in a business that's working like that, you know, um, in your, as part of your own journey on your own Ayurvedic practice, it will help you, uh, I'm not saying I've become a better person, but, you know, help you become a, a, a rounder person in a way, you know, you'll learn lots. So yeah, stretch, push the boundaries and do something that's better than already there. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, what would you say is your vision for Ayurveda for the next decade, right? 2020 has been a very uh, important year. Uh, and now when we look at 2025, 2030, what is your real vision for Ayurveda? I'm a big fan of the you know, magic wand effect and dreaming what you want to see in the world and then you know, writing it down and making a strategy and a plan for how you get there, envisaging that. You know, I'm a bit more sort of locked in the UK European world at the moment in a way where things go on here, but I, I feel strongly that the herbal organizations could come together. You know, in the UK, for example, I think we've got something like 15 organizations that represent Western Chinese and Ayurvedic uh, practice. You know, to the outside world, that doesn't really present a very unified voice and to a lot of regulators, there's, there's no difference between echinacea and ashwagandha, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Indian or American or Chinese. So I think that could happen. So on an Ayurvedic front, I think we could do that. You know, the Ayurvedic communities could come together. Um, I mean, I'd, wouldn't it be great if in India, the land of Ayurveda, the Ayurveda was integrated into a mainstream medical system, you know, that, a, a bit like it is in China, in a way, where in the majority of hospitals in China, you can go to the allopathic department or you can go to the Chinese herbal medicine or acupuncture department. And um, I know that historically that hasn't been uh, endorsed by the, the Indian government for the last, you know, decades or so. Um, but I, I, I think that would be an amazing thing for the, the Indian government to support that in education, uh, to support that in research, to support that in technology and production. I think that that would be the most powerful thing. And then around the world, I would see some of the bright lights. There's so many great practitioners and centers that are around the world, people working hard. I, I'd like to see them having a shared conversation and a shared strategy, how as the individuals and the small groups, they can all be, you know, going in the same direction, trying to, trying to shape a path where there is a greater understanding so that these questions you get from friends about quality and trust, you know, that, that doesn't happen. And the, there's a belief in the standards of education and a, a trust in the clinical practice. And that's obviously happening more and more. I think there's been huge progress the last couple of decades. I think there is yeah, quite a long way to go for that to happen, isn't there? I, I, you, you, Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, we're going to ask you some really quick questions and you can give us your answers, uh, you know, in a word or a line. Uh, so what is your favorite book for discovering Ayurveda? My favorite book for discovering Ayurveda? Well, I really love, uh, um, uh, you know, Robbie Svoboda's Life, Health and Longevity. Ayurveda, Life, Health and Longevity. I really enjoyed that. I read that was one of the first books I read actually about Ayurveda and that got me inspired. So I, I absolutely love that book and it stands the test of time and that's where I would go to. Of course, anything by Dr. Ladd is also you know, very accessible and I, and I love his work, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, your go-to Ayurveda hub, 
And I know this can be really difficult, but if you had to uh, pick one. You know, if I had to have one herb only for the 21st century, I'd probably go ashwagandha because I think it's a herb that, uh, you know, it, it helps ground you, uh, but it gives you energy. And I, and I think in our world of sensual bombardment and uh, social media overload, uh, that's a perfect, perfect herb for helping us adapt to our fast changing world. Wonderful. Uh, describe Ayurveda in one word. Ayurveda is love, really, I think. Ayurveda is about a love of life, of your fellow uh, family, friends, citizens, and a love of nature. So, yeah, love. Um, what is the one Ayurveda practice that you think everyone should follow? Um, well, there are a lot of them, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, that can feel a bit of a challenge sometimes. I mean... You know, Dinacharya, I think, is Ayurveda's best teaching for the world. Uh, but obviously, there's quite a lot of practices in that. So I'd have to just go to, um, you know, enhancing your digestive fire. Agni I'd, I'd, I'd always say that is the root and an amazing meditation, very educational as you understand your digestive fire, and it will only lead you to better health. So. And your one favorite place for experiencing authentic Ayurveda? You know, I haven't got a lot of experience of that, but I'm going to say home. I think your home is one of the best ways to do your dinacharya. But um, there's a, you know, Vedya grammar in India, I, I, I know a little bit, the, the, the um, uh, Panchkarma clinic down near Coimbatore with Dr. Ram Kumar is a very genuine and uh, uh, soothing healing space yeah. but there are so many there are, you know loads of great centers uh, so yeah uh, and uh, one final question Sebastian uh, any message that you have for uh, Ayurveda day as you're aware uh, we're marking Ayurveda day on 13th of November this year uh, and this is a global initiative which uh, will see participation from uh, you know over 60 countries uh, around the globe so a any message you have for this? Well, I just send my you know, best wishes to everyone involved in Ayurveda and the, you know, whether you've just started out on your journey or whether you've been involved for many, many years, you know, keep diving into its heart because there's always something more you can find out about your own heart and the, and the heart of the world. So yeah, keep diving in and go for it. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was uh, an absolute delight speaking to you. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.